Our next talk will not with Chris Kurva as announced, but we have a surprise guest, and this is Alexandra Sova, who will have this talk together with Chris Kurva. Hold it, and she is Data Protection Commissioner and IT Security Auditor, and at the moment she is as an expert uh, in in a group uh, at the German Parliament Bundestag for Information Security. And the second person who will give this talk is Chris Kurva. I know her as the founder of the Missy magazine. And then through some details, she uh, is now a permanent staff member of netspolitik.org. And I'm happy that these two will now talk to us about AI and about why it is important that AI is given political scrutiny and not as uh, we've, we always hear uh, voluntary self-regulation by the industry. So please give a warm applause to Alexander Sova and Chris Kova. Not too warm that applause, please. It's hot enough already. Uh, yes, welcome to this talk. We are very happy to have you here. Of course, we do not know how many of you there are because we can hardly see you and it's very hot on the stage. And very lit uh, as well, presumably. Yes. If you're here, we're happy that you're here. We would like to talk today about ethical guidelines for algorithms and so-called artificial intelligence, whatever you should consider that to be. We'll come to that. So who comes up with things like this and why? There is an incredible boom of guidelines at the moment. If you've lost track how many of them there are, especially in uh, these voluntary self-regulation guidelines in the AI area, then you're not alone in losing track. It really is. This comic here relates to a current study at the Zurich Technical University where they looked how many guidelines there are worldwide, and they, were, they found 84 different ethical guidelines and the largest uh, most of these have been appearing in the last two years so there's a lot happening right now this is a visualization visualization that the uh, some some center in Harvard has published did you catch the name of the center uh, these are only 32 guidelines for AI and uh, algorithms and these are guidelines from the industry, but also from NGOs and partly from state organizations. No one can really see what is depicted here, but that's not what this is about. It's more just to show that there is an incredible amount of things about and even attempts to put these into a simply understandable picture is almost doomed to fail because it's so vast. Another overview is what the NGO Algorithm Watch is trying to achieve on their website. They have a crowdsourced project where they collect AI guidelines. Everyone can take part. So if you find a new one that hasn't been published on there yet, you can submit it yourself and contribute to an even better overview. Uh, and well, of course, there are so many guidelines, I'd say, then in, that in science there is a whole new discipline that's forming around this, uh, including involving all kinds of areas and basically dealing with just all these guidelines and matching them uh, and putting AI and uh, algorithm guidelines together. Right. So the question, of course, why this boom? And that is not so surprising, the fact that we have this boom, because algorithmic decision processes is something that we encounter every day, uh, uh, private as well as professional areas, be it online dating, our mailboxes where spam is sorted out, in news feeds, in social media websites, uh, credits, uh, acceptance, uh, invitations to job interviews, uh, and with the, the Austrian unemployment agency, where those that apply for support are categorized into three um, drawers and uh, 
the amount of support they get depends on, on that categorization. So uh, you see that these algorithms are more and more incisive and influence our daily lives and, and uh, really affect the core of our lives and that therefore it's not surprising that with that development there are more and more calls and louder calls for uh, actual regulation or ethical rules to be established what these algorithms are allowed to do and some people call this artificial intelligence whatever that is supposed to mean and the uh, talk is also about ethical decision making, uh, automatic decision making, ADM. But basically, it's all about the same question, which is what are these algorithms supposed to be allowed to do and decide, and uh, should their use be restricted clearly, and what should they never decide about? There should be some red lines that uh, should not be crossed, which are not negotiable. What do we, do we not want to leave to the machines? And it is in fact the case, as Chris just said, uh, in many areas, politi political circles as well, there are people that are thinking about this. And of course, it's a bit unfortunate that uh, many companies that deal with machine learning or automated decision making and algorithms are not seated in, in Germany, mostly not even within the European Union, which doesn't make regulation any easier. So, um, the federal government and the parliament do not regard it this way, which means that they don't want to achieve anything less than an AI made in Germany. And thus, they uh, agreed in the coalition agreement for the last government between the Conservatives and the Social Democrats. Um, and that now results on the political level in a package with lots of institutional solutions. We decided to illustrate this with a quote from Swiss theater playwright Friedrich Dürrenmatt, form a commission, everyone, let's form a commission. In Germany, we have two groups that, uh, on the foundation of that coalition treaty, has formed. One of these is the Enquete Inquiry Commission, Intelligence and uh, Social Responsibility and uh, Economic and Ecological Potentials, which uh, was formed on request of the governing parties and the Green and Left parties in Parliament. And this deals with... Uh, the question where there are areas in AI or automatized decision, automatic decision making, where algorithms should that should not be employed at all. Where if there are areas where these technologies should not be used at all, and uh, the commission was supposed to uh, involve its findings in different commissions intensely, and after the summer break. In 2020, they are supposed to f present their results. Another commission that wants to be a bit faster is the Data Ethics Commission, which was founded by the German Interior Ministry and the Justice Ministry in July, so one month after the Commission of Inquiry. And uh, we have many well-known representatives here, Paul Lemmis, a consultant for the General Directorate of Justice at the EU and the German Federal Data Protection Commissioner Ulrich Kelber and uh, representatives of the of the Federal States uh, Data Protection Commission of the state of Schleswig-Holstein. And this commission is supposed to put forward their results in after summer 2019. Chris is going to talk about that. And after the constituting meeting, they had their first proposals. And the aim is no less than establishing an AI made in Europe. But it doesn't have to be in the coalition treaty that a commission has to be formed. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, there's no need to have, this, uh, have the coalition treaty as a basis. So the Hessian... Uh, Prime Minister has created a commission himself, a 
Council on Ethic, Digital Ethics last December, and that involves high-ranking representatives of civil society, e e economics, the bishop, uh, a local bishop, the former research minister, Heinz Riesenhuber, uh, the head of the Boston Consulting, and of course, uh, it's headed by the Prime Minister. And uh, this was just a short extract. The, this commission will work out various guidelines that might influence lawmaking in the future. But recommendations and papers that are produced have only national or regional effect mostly, while the technology, as I said, is developed outside of Germany and outside the European Union as well. So that takes regulation to a higher level, or the need that, that creates the need to regulate on a higher level, at least at the EU level, or ideally on a in a global agreement. Okay, we'll talk about the EU in a minute, but first of all, before we move on, let's look at what the guidelines are about, actually. Usually, these are collections of different ethical principles that are... Um, that are supposed to target the um, developers of this technology and they by developers we mean both software developers and companies that are responsible for this um, for these systems to be made sometimes they're even like large companies all of these guidelines are very very different some of them like this one We've, we, you see here, are really very tight. There's like only five areas. Others are very, very long. They're like a couple hundred pages and very detailed. Um, and there's one like by, by IEEE, which is an engineering society, which is very, very long. But there's still commonalities that we see. And we can see it by when we look at the IBM um, guideline because these um, points that are mentioned there are usually mentioned in all of these guidelines. So first of all is accountability. So who's responsible if um, an algorithm projects something or decides something? Second, um, explainability, so transparency. How can we understand, can we understand as people how the system arrived at this decision or prognosis, what kind of data or factors did it consider. Sometimes, in, when we talk about transparency, it's also about we need to make a, we need to make it transparent that there was an algorithm that made a decision here. So we can't. So algorithms have to show themselves. If the algorithm is working, then the people that are somehow that have something to do with this decision have to know that it was an algorithm that made this decision or that was involved. The fourth point is value alignment, which we kind of skipped. So fairness or equality is the fourth point, which is about um, algorithms should work so they're not discriminating based on identity and this is mainly about the data that the algorithm is trained with. If we know that the data isn't representative or the data is discriminating already or biased somehow in the training data because people are dis people that have made these decisions in the past were discriminating and then we um, train an algorithm on the basis of this data, then we know that this discrimination will be um, continued and will even be reinforced and strengthened. This is the fourth point. And the last point is user data rights or privacy. So um, data protection rights and what kind of data is allowed to be used. And these are kind of like a minimal, um, the minimal things that need to be in these ethical guidelines. But it's also interesting to look at what is not mentioned there or what is there very rarely. What are these guidelines not? One of them is uh, democratical controls. 
politischer Gesetzgebung. Like po political laws aren't usually mentioned. Was ebenfalls sehr selten geht, ist die Gefahr des Mit Missbrauchs. Äh, what, what is also not mentioned is how you can misuse this, these algorithms to um, sort of like undermine democratic processes, like um, change voting results or election results and then what is also not mentioned is um, the lack of diversity in the in this um, area that usually it's white men that are um, developing these um, these algorithms but the decisions are made not only about white men but also about uh, women and black people or people of color um, and this is like one of the ways how this could be um, discriminating and one idea to make sure that this is this does not happen as often or as likely is to make the developing teams more diverse but that's very very rare in these guidelines there's also no real talk about the um, hidden societal costs like the energy used or when um, training this algorithm or um, the very very low paid click workers that have to um, help train the algorithms and this is like in the debate on um, speak voice assistants and Alexa and now we found out that all of these don't only have self-learning algorithms but there's people that are listening there um, people usually from other countries that are um, labeling this data like 10 hours a day so that the algorithm can actually work and make accurate pr predictions. Yeah. 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 Genau. Springen wir vielleicht mal weiter. Okay, let's jump to the next point. Achso, nee, ich bin jetzt nochmal dran. No, sorry, it's my... Zum einen sind wir jetzt noch... I'll be talking about this a little bit. Einfach Schlauheiten von mir. Die Frage ist jetzt, the question is now, so what kind of um, impact do these guidelines have? Are there actually, is there actually an impact? How artificial intelligence is used? Because voluntary self-commitments, uh, regardless of whether they're from one company or complete, or like complete um, areas or um, sectors, they're voluntary. So you don't need to follow them. Es geben sich eben auch keine konkreten and, there's an, and the users of these algorithms or like those that are affected by these decision processes can't sue anyone based on these um, voluntary self-commitments. Um, if you want to, if you if you think a decision was made unfairly or a wrong medical diagnosis that might have actually devastating consequences for you and you can't use them in front of a court of law. But maybe we have, they have a positive impact. Why, so this would be a justification for having 84 of them. And there's a study from an um, ethics researcher from the University of Tübingen who looked at 15 of the most important guidelines, for example those of uh, Microsoft, Google and IBM, and he finds that most of them are pretty much useless. He basically looks at another study uh, that looked at students and developers, software developers, and asked and like um, gave them different um, decisions and wanted to look doesn't wanted to see does it make a difference whether they read these guidelines before or not and their conclusion was the effectiveness of guidelines or ethical codes is almost zero and they do not change the behavior of the professionals from the tech community oder das Statement. And um, they're kind of. Die die Studie durchgeführt he links haben. to another statement. It was basically, which said it was basically um, irrelevant whether we gave them these guidelines or not. We didn't see anything that changed their decisions. <laughs> yeah, well, too bad. Well, it's not. It's not very surprising. 
If you think of what kind of consequences this could have if you don't follow these guidelines, because, well, it's voluntary, so the worst case, if you don't follow it, is maybe um, some damage to your reputation for your um, developers or your company. But on the scale of possible consequences like um, having to pay a lot of money or having to go to jail and on one side and nothing on the other side, uh, uh, reputation damage is more on the side of nothing, really. It's not really a good lever to um, change behavior. Maybe that's why it's not very um, strange that not only in Europe, where um, legal regulation of industry has a long tra tradition, but also in the US, there's getting more and more. Th there's been more and more voices that want to make um, policy and basically regulate data protection and also algorithms more. Um, for example, Blues Schneier, who wants this for um, in information security, Internet of Things, and now also for algorithms. There's basically, it's, a, it's about the um, minimum requirements for these um, providers. We have more and more cr critical voices, but we don't really know what's going to happen there. And here there's a quote from the paper of, by Thilo Hagendorf, who's the ethical researcher who looked at this. And it shows that these guidelines, as so, in so far as they're from industry, are mostly PR means. And we should look at them exactly like this. Let's trust the what they're saying is please trust us. We're doing this. There's no need to regulate this in a law. And um, but in order to actually um, sort of regulate the risks of algorithmic decision making, they're not really useful. The philosopher, who also who is also in an in a high level EU Commission expert, EU Commission expert, um, he basically Thomas Metzinger, thank you. Um, he thinks he basically wants to um, introduce an ethical debate with the goal of um, having new laws in this area. And he, he thinks that these guidelines are. Um, kind of like are one way of making sure that these laws aren't coming soon. Uh, because the longer the debates are actually going on, the um, longer it will take until we get new laws. Okay, the method itself isn't really new. If you think back to you can kind of see a method within the U.S. Senate, actually. And that's kind of well known as filibustering, which is a method that is still used today in the U.S. Senate when um, decisions are uh, made that aren't very popular and that minorities want to bring through and then there's someone there doing a filibuster and this makes sure that um, no decision is reached until sort of like a new until they found a ma majority in back doors it's a long um, that has a long tradition and who um, who thought of it well, it wasn't um, Americans, it also wasn't the Swiss, it was um, something that was even found in the Roman Senate. And we see that these self-guidelines are kind of a way to delay, a, a delay tactics until to make sure that um, you don't really need laws if you kind of have these voluntary self-commitments. Part of this filibustering isn't only to publish these guidelines, but many companies are financing ethics um, chairs at universities. One example 
is from Munich, is the Institute for Ethics in Artificial Intelligence that um, is financed by Facebook at the moment, where you're supposed to have independent research, but Facebook is paying for it. And there's a couple of um, groups that is like Partnership AI, where um, which is an NGO where Facebook and Apple are kind of like meeting up to talk about this. And this is basically when when politicians say, oh, well, we need some regulation within the law, then the, these companies can point to these institutes and say, well, we don't really need that. And But what we see is that these companies are also trying to actually change the laws. They're doing um, lobby work. And one example of that is the work of the high-level expert group in the last year within the EU Commission that has two recommendations. One was ethical guidelines for artificial intelligence. And they were um, presented in April or at the beginning of the year. And in a second step, you should have sort of like um, concrete recommendations for new laws and um, some support. And that was very interesting. Who is actually in this group? So there's 52 experts that were supposed to, that um, worked on this for a year. And when you look at these, 23 of them are directly from industry, like from Zalando, Nokia, and so on. And then if you add the, lobby, the lobbying groups, like Digital Europe, where the big companies um, are basically organizing their interests. And basically it's 26 people from industry, which is half of this group, is um, industry representatives. And then, for example, SAP is in there three times. Once they have an artificial intelligence expert working at SAP, one is the... Um, the head of this expert group who's in the um, council of SAP and then there's obviously Digital Europe representative where SAP is also part of and who is not in there or almost not at all um, in this group that is supposed to have ethical guidelines. There's only four ethics researchers actually which is quite strange because they're, they're supposed to develop ethical guidelines there's 10 organizations for um, consumer protection and um, citizen rights um, and like there's but there's not that many data protection people um, which is also quite interesting because machine learning and artificial intelligence is really, really related to using data, but there's no one in there that does data protection, for example. And all of this has um, consequences, of course. We at Netzpolitik talked to many people that are in this high-level expert group. And originally, the group was supposed to think of red lines. So ethical, ethical borders, ethical lines where we could not negotiate, that were not negotiable, where um, we cannot use algorithms. For example, citizen scoring, autonomous weapons, or automated identification with um, facial recognition, or maybe hidden algorithms, where we say, well, very clear, within the EU, this is not allowed. And these things are still in there, but they're not called red lines anymore. Um, because the industry representatives have basically banned red lines, but now it's only like, oh, well, we don't really think that um, there's problems there maybe. Um, so if you work in this area, then you need to kind of document it very well. So there's um, differences in the wording. And of course, what you could say, well, it's just wording. But I think it says 
it basically shows how important this is for the industry and how much they're doing um, to ex to change this gu guideline, which, by the way, isn't a law. So it's just guidelines or recommendations. You could follow them if you want to, or you could not follow them. And there's no really um, any consequences that you have to uh, be afraid of. But of course, we assume that they might change um, sort of like EU EU commission, the EU Commission's policy in this regard. So there's a lot of energy in this. So the industry used a lot of energy, expended a lot of energy just to change these. So how about laws? Uh, yeah, that's a very good transition. Um, we should then consider how should, can we solve this dilemma and we looked at what industry or economy would like or what they would prefer not to have and then we will now we can point out whether there are approaches that can lead us to concrete solutions and uh, our preference for laws has been apparent already and uh, we have a few suggestions there where these could be where these could start where algorithm regulation could be based on the most well known of the laws since its introduction or its coming into effect in May 2018 is the general data protection regulation and that already by, through the fact that it protects people or personal data uh, is quite well suited to, to introduce restrictions uh, such as uh, separating training data from operative data um, and uh, on automated decision making. So that could be restricted or regulated. Yes. It's not the fact that there is nothing at all in terms of regulation, as Alexandra just said. There are some areas, for example, the GDPR, where it does say that the people concerned have the right to not just be subjected to an automated processing or profiling. But uh, the catch here is in the word not exclusively, not just, because if you then press an OK button, if, if you have a person pressing an OK button, a human, after the decision, decision making, then your credit is not going to be rejected automatically, but, but someone will have to click. That means that it's not an inclusive, exclusively automated decision making anymore. It then is something that would be compliant to the GDPR, and that is one of the reasons why Article 22 has uh, always been called a blunt sword, and uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't have the prerequisite of automated decision making, which is very hard to define and circumvent, as we've just explained. But also because it has certain exceptions that does allow this. For example, a consent, as always. So again. Uh, and then Article 22 is history. There's another one, Article 15 in the GDPR, which uh, stipulates that the data subject has the right to uh, be informed about subsequent, uh, 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 informed about the existence of automate, automated decision making. But what does that mean? Experts do not agree. Does the uh, code actually have to be published? Uh, does it need to be made known what uh, is optimized for? So it's very hard to actually get this connected to uh, the logic involved in automatic decision making. And what also exists are anti-discrimination laws. In Germany, we have the law for uh, equal treatment of people uh, on the basis of religion, age, gender, and several other categories. There is an explicit prohibition, uh, a criminal one, against uh, discrimination. But that only comes into effect when there is concrete damage and you don't really want to wait that long. The problem is that uh, it, it can only go to the courts when something's happened. But if you realize, ah, the system is discriminating, even if concretely it hasn't disadvantaged or damaged anyone, then 
the anti-discrimination laws as we have them right now would not be effective. And uh, uh, to wrap things up also at the EU level, because a lot of things are happening there right now, Ursula von der Leyen, the new Commission President, uh, has announced that she, in her first 100 days in office, will bring forward an, an initiative about AI and the question, of course, is how can she so quickly form all these ideas? There is the excerpt, the high-level expert group, which has proposed a few things, but uh, they haven't matured to the level that within a few months you could have a concrete le legal proposal, legislative, legislative proposal as a result. And uh, there is a report by the Financial Times that uh, says that there is a data protection commission in the EU Commission which uh, talks about regulating face recognition and will only allow some very few strict exceptions where this can be used. And what would also be quite revolutionary is that data from video recordings that could potentially be used for facial recognition is classified as biometric data. And that, again, would severely restrict the use of this technology. It could then not be used anymore by just putting up a sign that says there's a video surveillance uh, here in operation. And the assumption is everyone that passes through the area will give their consent. So there are some laws that are being advanced and stepped up. And it's interesting to see what will come from there. And we've been told in summer, well, an extended definition of summer, but in summer the Data Ethics Commission will put forward their guidelines. That will be interesting to see what's in there. And should we, yeah, let's briefly talk about, uh, to just show that a law might even not be sufficient. It has to be controllable. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, network enforce enforcement law comes with methods for controlling whether it's followed properly. But the weakness here is these controls are not binding. Uh, I'm talking about things like certification. We have security certifications that are fairly widespread, ISO 9126, for example. But these are either only relevant for very small areas of business, and even there, often they are not binding. People can circumvent this. And another mechanism is audits and checks, something that is part of current laws, for example, auditing. Uh, and every year, I think uh, in May, a test state has to be obtained a certificate. That is limited, though, to companies that are on the stock market, but that is an option to establish such a controllability. And uh, the other hotly debated topic is uh, quality seals. We have a um, registered association called the AI Federal uh, Association, and they have a long list of things that you can sign up to, but again, this is not binding, and this is no, does not constitute an option uh, to actually verify is just a guideline that you sign. So a lot of things, a lot of things have to be done there. And the question is, can something so simple be actually done? What about the robot laws established by Asimov? Could they be put into practice? Do you remember the, those robot laws? I can't see you very well. The first robot law, do you remember it? How are robots supposed to deal with humans? What is a robot not allowed to do? It cannot cause damage to humans. The second law, logically, if a human is master, then what are you not allowed to do with the human? I know it's hot. You are not allowed to damage the human. And the third law, can we get that as well? Uh, you are not allowed to damage yourself. These are the three robot, robot laws by Asimov. Uh, can you actually prohibit robots or AIs to do something? 
Yeah. And uh, uh, second law, it has to obey its master. Okay, a Hoover robot was developed that swallows insects. So if this robot is about uh, and uh, encounters um, mayfly, it will stop. It's, it tries not to swallow insects. So you can put, a, put in a rule like that into a system to disallow certain actions. And finally, a plea. Legislative processes are happening right now. So if you're interested in the shaping of these rules, if you want to know what these will actually turn out to be, you can take good care in the next few months and maybe even introduce your own suggestions and say what should actually appear, what wordings these laws should have, because we know that Google, Facebook and others will have a whole army of people sitting in Brussels that will work on this with uh, a lot of energy and the simple question will then be who should we leave this to? Who should be making the rules concerning machines? Should these be those companies or should we ourselves shape things? Thanks a lot. Ja, vielen Dank, Chris und Alexandra. Und wir haben jetzt noch fünf Minuten. Okay, we have five minutes for questions and answers. Stellen und zu beantworten. Dafür ist ein Mikrofon in der Mitte. There's a mic in the middle and a mic at the end. So please just walk up to the microphones if you have questions. Ja, hallo. Ich würde gerne noch mal zurückkommen auf die. Hi, I'd like to go back to the study. That was supposed to prove that guidelines do not have an influence on behavior of um, AI researchers. I'd be interested in the study design. Because if we ask people that know something about AI but haven't seen these guidelines, I can't really imagine that they exist. So I'm kind of doubting this study, but maybe it's better than I think. We can actually just uh, send you the sources so you could look at the study yourself, as far as I know. There, this is about kind of vignettes, so they were given decisions, would you do it like this or like this, and what kind of consequences could happen there. And there was n no difference seen, independently of whether they have s received the um, ethical guideline or not. Their behavior didn't change. Was that people that were um, working in AI? No, it was actually software developers and students. So those that were actually developing these systems or those that were educated to develop these systems. But please look at the study yourself. More questions. Is there a question back then? Okay, up in the front. I have a question, like when we look at China or the US, where the, we don't have as strict guidelines, isn't there a danger of kind of like leaving Europe behind in AI? <laughs> Do you want to say something about this? It's possible, yes. And often this is a reason given for why we don't have laws in this area. You, people pretend that regulation will actually like put a break on innovation or development, but um, that's not, but especially in data protection, you can see it, the voices in the US actually right now, um, like from a guy in Silicon Valley, they really 
want um, politics to be involved. They want um, politics to make laws um, and basically to observe what is happening. And I think there's a tradition. And we see that these self-guidelines aren't actually as effective in the U.S. as they used to be. More questions? Yeah, thank you. My question, or maybe my remark, the robot um, laws is a little bit naive because it's kind of difficult to decide what is good or bad, evil. And like we have these algorithms that are learning discrimination that's already in the data. Even if they're learning something without kind of like hearing anything about um, sort of color of skin or um, sex. But then the it might actually be hidden in the data. Like in German, um, the way your um, your job description is spelled depends on whether you're male or female. So um, it's kind of difficult to um, kind of like have this data. And how can we deal with this problem? Yeah, this problem with discrimination and especially this like um, discrimination that's taken from training data is really one of the biggest problems that we see at the moment. And we see this, for example, we just, we need to, we need people to be more conscious. What you see is like this proxy bias, even if these categories aren't in the data. The, the algorithm actually, through pattern recognition, finds um, something that is very closely related and then kind of like sees this discrimination and manages to continue this discrimination, even though developers are trying not to are trying to prevent this discrimination. And that's one of the big problems at the moment. There's, there's people working on solutions in this area. Uh, and we can see that, like for example, Amazon had um, basically got rid of their um, application algorithm because they were not able to get a hold of this problem. And I think that's the big... And I think that's uh, what needs to be done. And... Um, Obviously, what we need to do is those people that are responsible of choosing the systems need to basically say, well, no, we can't use this system. And I think the same thing should happen with um, systems that are very error prone. Are these systems already ready to be used? And then I think people should make the decision of not using this system. And I think that's the, the important consequence. Bitte schnell, please be quick. Okay, um, the grund tenor war ja sehr kritisch gegenüber. Okay, so you were more critical with regards to the rules. I have a question about the door opener argument. The team around Wendell should basically um, get um, spiders and not get um, ladybugs. Was it a positive example, the ladybug example? It was a positive example for a guideline. I'm not saying that guidelines or rules or laws are the right thing, but um, there's lots of solutions that we can, lots of things that we can solve with um, laws, because then we need to have, because then we need to kind of make a law. Um, because these algorithms, they have different ways of learning, and one way of learning is to kind of give them a guideline before starting. So if A happens, do B, if C happens, do D, and people 
are kind of trying to circumvent making this um, making this decision, so to speak. And in theory, what you would have to do is tell the algorithm what to do. If you have a white person and a black if you have a white applicant and a black applicant, please Genau. Wie lautet dann die Vorgabe? Choose the white applicant or the black applicant. Sorry, I'm not being politically correct here. And this is a very good example because it shows that there is a possibility to basically tell the um, algorithm what to do in this case. But we need to find someone who would do that and that's kind of uh, complicated. So thank you for um, this talk. And thank you for listening in to um, this translation by Zebalis and Tony. Um, if you have any feedback, please.